Now, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. If you've been in church for any length of time, you will have learned that song in Sunday school. We all know Zacchaeus when you first mention his name, that he was very short, small in stature. I'm sure it wasn't easy for him being so short. He probably heard all of the short jokes in his day, such as Zacchaeus, you, might have, you should have been a rabbi. At least your sermons would have been short. Or I feel sorry for short people, Zacchaeus. When it rains, they are the last to know. You know, there was a preacher uh, uh, in Florida, and he was six feet, seven inches tall. But he had a friend who would always ask him, time after time, how's the weather up there? One day, the pastor just got so tired of it, he just let a little spit come out of his mouth, and it dropped on the man's head. He looked down and said, it's raining. <laughs> he probably, Zacchaeus, loves strawberry shortcake, don't you know? He would have made a good shortstop. Zacchaeus. He was in a place called Jericho. Jericho was a very wealthy and important town. It was 17 miles south of Jerusalem. It was uniquely situated for attracting wealth. In the Jordan Valley, it commanded both the approach to Jerusalem and the crossing of the river, which gave access from the lands to the east to the west where the Mediterranean Sea laid. It had a great palm forest with world-famous balsam groves, which perfumed the air for miles around. Historians say its gardens of roses were known far and wide, and people called it the City of Palms. The Jewish historian Josephus called it, quote, a divine region, the fattest in Palestine. The Romans carried its dates and its balsam to worldwide fame through its trade. All of this combined to make Jericho one of the greatest taxation centers in all of Palestine. Under Roman rule and occupation, there were three such centers. One was in Capernaum, one was in Caesarea, and one was in Jericho. Zacchaeus is identified as a ruling tax collector, or the chief, arche is the Greek word, where that person would be employed by the Roman Empire. And under the Roman system, men bid on those positions. They would pledge to raise a certain amount of money, and anything they raised over that pledged amount was for their own personal profit. Zacchaeus was a man who had reached the top of his profession, but at great personal and family cost. He was one of the most hated men in the district. He was wealthy, but he was miserable. He was rich, but he was destitute on the inside. He had built his wealth on the backs of his own countrymen. What made it even worse that he was in collusion and cooperation with an occupying enemy, the government of Rome. The path he had chosen made him an outcast. He was despised, hated by his fellow Jews. But on this day, Zacchaeus was reaching out to see if the love of God could reach his life and make a difference for him. When you think about the natural situation here, Zacchaeus climbs a tree to be able to see. It wasn't like when he tried to see over the crowd or around them that people said, oh, it's you, Zacchaeus, sir. Come on, we'll make room for you. No, when they saw him, they probably stepped in front of him because they knew he was short. They hated Zacchaeus. He had cost them dearly. He was a traitor. He had sold them out. But Zacchaeus decides to climb a tree. When he climbs that tree, I can imagine what's going on in his mind. You see, Jericho wasn't too far from Bethany. Bethany is where Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Word quickly travels of something like that. Zacchaeus had heard about Jesus. And I'm thinking when he's in this tree, he's wondering and he's saying to himself, what does he look like? I wonder how tall he'll be. What kind of build will he have? Maybe I'll get a glance of his countenance. They say that his countenance is inviting as if God's love shines through his eyes. Maybe I'll hear him speak. Maybe he'll give a teaching. Maybe I'll watch him lay hands on someone and heal them. 
They say he's completely different from the Pharisees, the priest, and the rabbis. I wonder what he'll be wearing. The crowd is large. The noise level increases. Some are mad because of the congestion. Others are pointing out and shouting, there he is. He's coming now. See him. Zacchaeus is securely situated in his perch in the tree. And as he begins to focus his eyes to take in every detail, suddenly the man who isn't determined and desperate enough to climb a tree to see Jesus is seen by Jesus himself. In the midst of thousands of people, Jesus focused on one man up in a tree. When you think about this story, not only was Zacchaeus short in stature, but he was short in joy and fulfillment. He had all the things that money could buy. He had no love or friends in his life. We're not told anything about his family, but we do know that his parents had the best intentions for him because they named him Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, which means pure or innocent in Hebrew. Sadly, Zacchaeus had turned out everything but pure and innocent. He had sold out to the Roman Empire. He was using his position to leverage and extort and abuse his own people to make himself wealthy. Money is what he worshiped. Money had become his God. A chief tax collector is wealthy because that was a commercial center for taxes. Thieves knew it would be, and people that come and go from Jericho, they lied in wait. It's a parable Jesus told that a man went from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was accosted by thieves. He was beaten up, left for dead, and a rabbi came by and passed by on the other side of the street. A priest came by and said, I, I don't want to go near him, but a Samaritan, the most li least likely, stopped and attended to his knees his needs. Zacchaeus was a thief. He had robbed his own people. His love of money had taken over his life. It's interesting. We like to think that doesn't happen to us. But a provocative book by the name The Day America Told the Truth by Dr. Kim Patton asked the simple question, what are you willing to do for $10 million? What would you do for $2 million? We are good people, Kim Rice, and if we say so ourselves, we generally do. Does cold, hard cash change our morals? Is it a pivotal question, a money-oriented society? So we asked this in an interview. And in interviewing thousands of people, they found out in America, for $10 million, people would get up and walk away from their families. For $10 million, Americans, a percentage, would give up their citizenship. For $10 million, many would leave their spouse. For $10 million, Americans said, 10% of them at least, that they would withhold their testimony and let a murderer go free. And what's most shocking is that a percentage said for $10 million, they would seriously consider killing a stranger. Does money change people? In the life of Zacharias, it did. When you read this, the book by William H. Cook, it describes a meeting in 1923 of the richest men in America at the time. He decided to follow the history of their lives and what happened to them. These men all controlled vast amounts of wealth. Charles Schwab, the president of the largest independent steel company, lived on borrowed money the last five years of his life and died penniless. Richard Whitney, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, served time in Sing Sing prison. Albert Fall, a member of the president's cabinet, was pardoned from prison so he could die at home. Jesse Livermore, the greatest bear on Wall Street, as he has been described, committed suicide. Leon Frazier, the president of the Bank of International Settlement, committed suicide. Ivan Kruger, the head of the world's greatest monopoly, committed suicide. And Zacchaeus was on the same trajectory. It was in his book, I Talk Back to the Devil, A.W. Tozer reminds us, 
Money often becomes between a man and God. Someone said that you can take two small 10 cent pieces, just two dimes and shut out the view of a panoramic landscape. Go to the mountains, he says, and just hold two small coins in front of your eyes and the mountains are still there, but you cannot see them at all because a dime is shutting off all the vision that catch your eye. It doesn't take a large quantities of money to come between us and God, just a little. Placed in the wrong position, it will effectively obscure our view. You know, the richest man that ever lived on planet Earth wrote these words, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless, King Solomon. Martin Luther, the Reformation leader, wrote, there are three conversions every person must experience. The conversion of the head, a conversion of the heart, and thirdly, the conversion of the pocketbook. You see, you can be at the top of the heap and live an unfulfilled life, wealthy but not happy. Jesus looked at him up in that tree and he called him by name. Zacchaeus had two obstacles immediately in his way, the crowd and then his own short stature, but he quickly overcame them through his business savvy, resiliency and diligence. He climbed a sycamore some say a mulberry tree, much like an oak that had a climbable limbs that grew low to the ground. Don't let the crowd keep you from Jesus. He didn't let it, he climbed that tree. What is he saying to us, Jesus, in this passage and the Gospel of Luke? Don't let the opinions of people keep you from Jesus. Don't let the crowd steal your vision of what you need to see from Jesus Christ. I hear it all the time as a pastor. Well, I would come to church these days, but there's too many hypocrites in the church. And my response immediately is, that doesn't mean you have to be one of them. What is he doing? He's letting the crowd of some people that he knows in a church somewhere block his vision. Zacchaeus said, I know I'm short and I know these people don't like me, but I'm determined to get a view of what this Jesus really is all about. But secondly, he climbed a tree. What a strange thing for a wealthy older man to do. He climbed the tree. And the man who couldn't see over the crowd or around the crowd suddenly had the best seat in the house. You see, if we would see Jesus, we too must scramble higher than ourselves. The reason this passage is so incredible, because less than a week, Jesus would be arrested, he would be tried, he would be condemned and sentenced to crucifixion. He would give his life and be raised from the dead. A week before he paid for the sin of mankind, he goes to the house of a man called Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, the call is personal. Jesus knew his name. But he knew more than that. He knew his ways. He knew his wants. He knew that he intended to deal with him in an individual way. Jesus didn't say, make haste quickly. If your name is Zacchaeus, make haste. No more preparation is required. I am ready to change your life. Come down, Jesus said. The sinner and the Savior must meet to the proud and the self-reliant the savior says come down for today i must stay at your house it signifies the eternal purpose of god the counsel of his will this moment of mercy must be realized he came down from the tree the bible says gladly rejoicing that jesus saw him and wants to come to his house we are not told exactly what happened the next few hours at Zacchaeus' house, what confessions were made, uh, what pouring out of the heart occurred, words of counsel, instruction, guidance, consolation. We don't know any of those details, but what we do know is that Jesus and Zacchaeus met one another. The Savior had found his sheep, and the sheep had found his shepherd. Jesus concludes the story and Luke says it and quotes it. Today, salvation has come to this house. 
Oh, would that be said to every single household here that the salvation of the Lord has come to your household. Can somebody say amen? amen. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost you see, a true conversion always proves itself. It has a public confession. It has restitution mixed in it. It has liberality, the, the, the desire to give, and it changes the home. Zacchaeus has all of the above, but he goes over and above what the law of Moses said. The Bible says in the book of Exodus that if a person was robbed and it was intentional, it was violent, that a fourfold restitution would be given back. It also says if uh, uh, it had been an ordinary robbery and the original go goods were not restorable, double the value had to be repaid. If voluntary confession was made and a voluntary restitution offered, the value of the original goods had to be paid plus one-fifth. But Zacchaeus is so changed. He said, I want to give half of what I have to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone, I want to pay them back four times what I have defrauded them of. Have you ever wondered what happened to Zacchaeus? Church history and church fathers give us some insight. What happened to Zacchaeus after Jesus left his house in Jericho and went on into Jerusalem to give his life? Did he follow Jesus to Jerusalem? Did he witness the triumphal entry or the crucifixion? Was he one of the 120 on the day of Pentecost or maybe a part of the crowd that Peter preached to? I could certainly see this transformed man going to Jerusalem for the Passover with his newfound faith and being caught up in the events surrounding Jesus. But a Fairly early church tradition, dating back to the second century, says Zacchaeus became the first bishop or pastor of Caesarea. It is certainly possible this could happen because with the persecution that broke out after Stephen's death, Zacharias, who lived in a relatively nearby Jericho, moved to the coast. And Caesarea was an important city. As, as a former Roman employee, Zacchaeus may have felt very comfortable there. He probably was a well-educated man, and the biblical account shows us an exuberant personality. All of these would seem to fit together. We don't know this for sure. But many believe this was the journey. There is one other option, according to Clement of Alexandria, an early church writer who said Zacchaeus became Matthias and became one of the 12 apostles. Matthias was the one who was elected at the day, after the day of Pentecost to fill Judas's spot. And while Judas lost his position due to the love of money, Zacchaeus became one of the apostles due to the giving up of his love of money for the sake of following Christ. The first will be last and the last will be first. The love of money took Judas from the first chosen ones to the last having no part with Jesus. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save. You may not realize, but that wording, the Son of Man, is used 88 times in the New Testament. It was Jesus' favorite title of himself. It actually is a messianic statement couched in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel that Daniel sees a vision and the son of man is given authority and dominion to rule and reign from the ancient of days. Jesus said, I am the son of man. But then the son of man is used in Ezekiel that refers to the fact of his humanity. Jesus was 100% human flesh and blood and yet he was the God incarnate. The son of man comes to do two things. It's called the infinitives here, the purpose of. Why did he come? It was more than to be a great teacher or to be heaven's prophet or a priest. Luke is showing us that Jesus is clearly defining it. The reason he came was for two things. He came to seek and he came to save. The word seek means to search for, to go and search, to look for. The word save means to rescue and to bring back. Who is he seeking? What is he wanting to save people from? He is seeking those who are lost and to bring them back. 
So often in the church in America, we think of the word being lost as being completely uh, far from God where heaven and hell, heaven is missed and hell is the reward of being lost. But when you look at the word lost in the New Testament, it really means out of place. To be lost means you're not where God wants you to be. He created you and shaped you and formed you. You have all kind of gifts and talents. Zacchaeus, look how ambitious, look how diligent, look how hard you've worked. You've risen above, you've compensated for your short stature, but you're lost. God has more for you. Isn't this the story in Luke's gospel when the shepherd had 100 sheep and he counts them and only counts 99? There's one that's not there. He leaves the 99 and he goes out searching. And he finds that sheep, doesn't hit it over the head with a staff, but picks it up and puts it on his shoulders. Isn't that the case of the coins that the old widow woman lost? It would have been a dowry, an inheritance for her, 10 coins in a headdress. And she looked at it one day and one was missing. And so she swept her whole house because the coin wasn't where it was supposed to be. Can I ask you today, are, are you where you should be? Are you in the place that God would have you to be? And then the trilogy of that parable is the prodigal son. He said to the father, I want my inheritance now. And the Bible says he went out from his home, spent all that he had until he came to himself and came back home. He was out of place. You see, giving your heart to God means you're willing to let him put you where he wants you and to place you why, where he's fashioned and created you to be. We see the physical limitations here, but Jesus saw the spiritual need. How many are glad this morning he looks past our faults and he sees our need? Everything changes when you know you're loved. When Zacchaeus looked into the eyes of Jesus and he's thinking, all these people, and you look up at me, and you look at my wretched life, and you want to come home with me? I don't think he could have got down from that tree quick enough. I believe Zacchaeus grew an inch with every step. He began to grow in stature. And when Jesus looks across the table into Zacchaeus' eyes, Zacchaeus says, this is what I've been missing. This is what I've longed for. This money hasn't done it for me. No one loved him and valued him until he met the good shepherd. Can somebody say amen? amen? If you want to experience the love of God like Zacchaeus did, you have to get close enough to experience it. You need to be repositioned. Isn't it interesting that Luke, the doctor, the physician, in his gospel, he is dealing with the fact that money can rule people's lives. Money can become a god in people's lives. I suppose as a physician, having treated people that had wealth, Luke was very privy and very attentive to those who had money but were lost out of place. I mean, when you look at it in Luke chapter 12, there's a parable of the rich fool. He had so much come in, he built bigger barns and bigger barns, not because he was ungodly, we're told, or, or that he was uh, immoral, but the fact that he didn't acknowledge God. The Bible says he died and was rich in this world's goods, but was poor towards God. In Luke chapter 16, there is the rich man and Lazarus. In Luke chapter 18, there is the rich young ruler. And what a contrast that Zacchaeus is to the rich young ruler. You remember him. What must I do to be saved? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, I've done all these things from my youth up. And then Jesus gets to the core of his issue. Give what you have to the poor and follow me. And the Bible says the rich young ruler walked away sad, downcast. Jesus didn't go after him. He simply turned to his disciples and said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven. 
The Eye of the Needle was a very small entryway into the city. It was at night that all the caravans came through. You couldn't bring things in on the camel. The camel had to be stripped, so you couldn't take a lot of things out without anybody seeing it. But these camels could barely squeeze through. The disciples heard this and said, well, Lord, who can be saved? He said, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Hallelujah. Luke gives us this insight. Can I ask you this morning, does it matter where you are in your giving? Yes. It's like Luke is saying, Jesus says the use of one's money is the true barometer of one's faith, one's walk with God. But you say, Pastor, how could this be? It could be this way. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Can I ask you, are you in the right place with God in your giving? We can busy ourselves in thinking that accumulation of things is what's going to make us happy. And I'm not saying that you can buy your way to heaven because you cannot. We are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of the Lamb. But did you know in the Bible there are 500 verses that speak about faith and prayer, but there's 2,300 that speak about money because that's where the rubber hits the road. If Jesus has your heart, he has all of you. Isn't it amazing that Jesus stood up after hearing Zacchaeus giving to the poor and repaying those whom he had defrauded Jesus said, today, salvation has come to this house. The story of Zacchaeus stands in the marked contrast of that of the rich young ruler. I'm going to ask our musicians if they would come. We have been asking you for the month of February to earnestly and prayerfully consider making a renewed commitment to what we call kingdom builders As you know, over the past eight years, we have gone down from $6.3 million of indebtedness to under $2 million. We have saved over $2 million in principle, and we have saved nearly $700,000 in interest. Put them together, we have saved $2,726,000. We have a remaining balance of $1,969,608. And we are encouraging you to make a commitment perhaps greater than you've ever done before. To commit with God's help to support above a tithe kingdom builders for 2018. Kingdom builders is giving for a greater harvest And may I simply say that Kingdom Builders is not making the monthly payment on the note. We make that out of our general fund. Kingdom Builders, every penny goes on top of the note. That's why we paid our principal down. That's why we've saved all this interest because in just a few short years, we want to be able to look at the next generation and say, here you are, a resource fully complete and total facility without any debt hanging over your head. Touch the city and reach the world for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have not been here since we have been speaking about Kingdom Builders for March the 4th, and you need a Kingdom Builder card, you would just slip your hand up right now. It's a little blue card. We'd like for the ushers to prepare themselves. Kingdom Builders giving for a greater harvest. We'd like for you to slip your hand up and if you have not received one of these cards. On this card, you will see that there are four levels of giving. There is the level of extravagant, which means extra or elaborate, unrestrained, exceeding the norm. We're asking that amount to be $2,000 or above. I know there are many here who can give that amount and a little more, and we encourage you to give according to your blessing. I'm going to give extravagant because I feel the Lord has blessed me extravagant. 
Not that I have lived lavishly. I've been very frugal in my lifestyle. But I'm telling you, there's joy in my heart to be able to give to the kingdom builders. But then, secondly, there is the level of exceptional, which is an amount of $1,500 we're asking you to pledge over the year. This is better than average. It's called superior, and it's called rare. The third level is for those who would be audacious enough, which means daring and adventurous, to pledge $1,000 to kingdom builders. And then the fourth level was the level of being confident and assured to be bold enough to make a commitment of $500 for kingdom builders. Now we can reach our goal if we would follow the ideas on the screen here. If we could put those up, if we could have 40 individuals or family members to give $2,000 or more, it would give us a total of 80,000. If we could have 25 people who would say, you know, Pastor, I've been blessed enough. I've never given or pledged this amount before, but I'm going to 1,500 for the year 2018. This would give us 30,000. 25 for $1,000 would give us 25,000. And 130 people who would just pledge $500. And for many, that will be a huge sacrifice. But if you'll do it, that'll give our amount of 50,000. And this is our goal for this year. $200,000. It is doable. It is workable. We can even break this down just a little bit further. If you make a pledge to be an exceptional giver of $1,500, you are looking at an amount of $125 a month or $24 a week. If you would pledge $1,000, that would be $84 uh, a month or $20 a week. If you would pledge a bold amount, it would be $42 a month or $10 a week. You see, together, we can do something supernatural. We can way ahead of the time, and we can save all kinds of funds to make a greater difference in the world. So I want to encourage you to be prayerful if you are able to bring the entire amount on the first Sunday of March, it would be amazingly helpful because the more we can pay on the note earlier in the year, the more principal and interest we save. If you say, Pastor, I can't do that, but I'll give the best I can. If you can bring half of the amount, it would help. If you can just bring the amount that would have been like a three-month um, amount from January, February, and March, it would be a major help. In other words, all of us doing our part can make a huge, huge difference. Does it make a difference? The Gospel of Luke says it does. The Gospel of Luke said everywhere Jesus went, when people were touched by his love, there was a desire in their heart to give. In closing this morning, he was 17 years old, an honor student. He was close to his mother, his wheelchair-bound father, and his younger brother. Jason was his name. He was an expert swimmer, and he loved to scuba dive. He left home on Tuesday morning to explore the springs, an underground cave near his home in West Central Florida. His plan was to be home in time to celebrate his mother's birthday by going out to dinner with his family that night. Jason, however, became lost in the cave. Then, in his panic, he apparently got wedged in a narrow passageway. When he realized that he was trapped, he shed his yellow metal air tank and he unsheathed his diver's knife. And with the tank as a tablet, and the knife as a pen, he wrote one last message to his family. I love you, mom and dad, and Christian. Then he ran out of air and he drowned. Can I say to you that Jesus Christ, on the way to the cross, stopped into a man nobody liked? He said, Zacchaeus. Come down. Quickly. I must come to your house. And when love broke through, 
Zacchaeus was changed. We think of being lost as being damned. Being lost is that, but it has more than that connotation. It means being out of place. It's being not where God wants you to be. That describes Zacchaeus. I'm so glad on March the 11th, 1973, on the back row of a large church, the good shepherd saw me and he called me because I was lost. I wasn't where I needed to be with God. I was doing my own thing. I was lost, but Jesus' love came breaking through. 